And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Welcome everybody to the Book of Enoch video commentary uh, over here on nystv.org. This is part of our video commentary where we are going through the entire Book of Enoch together, looking through it scripture, scripture by scripture, line by line, associating it with the Bible, uh, seeing how it lines up. And David has been leading us on this. David Carrico, welcome David to the program. My pleasure, John, to be here again with the Book of Enoch commentary, which I just dearly love. And we'll get to go through two chapters today because Enoch chapter 64 is just two verses. So we're going to make gain a little ground today. Very cool. I'm excited about it. And, and we're um, in Enoch chapter 64 and 65, I believe. Is that the right, David? 60, that is correct. 64. Fallen Angel Knowledge yes. is the title we're going to give to this chapter for obvious reasons. Well, David, let's get to it. All right. Here we go. And we'll begin oh. with Enoch chapter 64, verse 1. And we will be going through... Uh, chapter 64 and 65, and Enoch chapter 64 consists of two verses. And other forms I saw hidden in that place. I heard the voice of the angels saying, These are the angels who descended to the earth and revealed what was hidden to the children of men and seduced the children of men into committing sin. That is... Enoch chapter 64, and there's a profound statement being made here of the gravity of that which the fallen ones did, and it's brought out is that these fallen angels showed unto mankind things that they should not have known. In the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, there's a scripture that says knowledge increases sorrow. And that's true in the life of a believer, because a lot of times the more you know the more you see that's wrong, and it makes you sorrowful. And there's such a thing that human beings and mankind are looking into things they should never have looked into. They're crossing lines in science and medicine and morality that God never meant to cross. There's some things that God wants to keep from mankind because they don't need to know. It's just like giving a little child uh, information about dynamite. They're just going to hurt themselves. And the things that was released, this fallen angel knowledge, I believe that what's going on today in, uh, you know, the book of Daniel says, in the last days knowledge shall be increased. And I believe a lot of the technologies we see today the the metaverse, uh, 
of social of media things that this is fallen angel knowledge so many things i believe that with all of my heart and i believe that a lot of these things came from um back engineering these nephilim craft i have really believe that a lot of these recovered crafts that back engineered them and even from uh, we were talking in our last episode william cooper claims that there's actual cooperation between these fallen entities and the u.s military and i would not doubt that especially in times like now you know you talk about in the scripture it talks about the prophecy of the euphrates river drying up and the kings getting together in that area preparing for battle or the fallen ones getting prepared for battle have you seen the euphrates le- the river lately david yeah it's pretty much a puddle yeah. it's no like there there's a video i was watching on on youtube where a guy was showing uh 2020 i believe is the euphrates river same spot same location the very next one it's literally it's like a little stream going through it looked like the ohio river almost as big as it was now yeah. to a little stream going through there yeah i mean i don't know what could be a more in your face sign to people that read the scriptures that yeah. uh, things are things are at the door and this is what scripture tells us deuteronomy twenty nine twenty nine: the secret things belong unto the lord our god but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. The Word of God is such a magnificent document that we could study it every day for hours all of our life and never mine out the full riches of it and how little esteem the Word of God is. And these things that... Uh, are going into transhumanism, this uh, RNA technology, and all of these things. They're going into things, obviously, changing the gender of um, little boys and little girls. These are places that mankind should never have went. And this is a result of this is what, what, what we're seeing here. The revelation of these things from the fallen angels to mankind. And, you know, one of the worst things you can do for someone is tell them something they don't need to know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. this is what, the, I mean, there's things here that mankind has just not been able to handle. Yeah, it's like telling a meth addict how to, how to make meth and giving them the tools to do it. You know, that's exactly, yeah, mankind, you can't trust mankind. You can't even trust yourself sometimes, you know. And That is but, so true. Yeah. Now in Enoch chapter 6, verse 6. And they were all, and they were in all 200 who descended in the days of Jared on the summit of Mount Hermon, and they called it Mount Hermon because they had sworn and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. And the 200 fallen ones came down, and they swore an oath together to the corruption of mankind, and it was a plan. They had a plan. They swore an oath. It was a definite uh, scheme that was organized. And at the heart of this was revealing unto mankind knowledge. And this fallen angel knowledge that was dispensed from the fallen angels to mankind was done purposely for their corruption and their destruction. And in Enoch chapter 8, and Azazel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates and made known to them the metals of the earth and the art of working them and bracelets and ornaments. Now, on, on the, the working of metals, uh, you know, I think there, uh, you know, and I, we got a lot more here than just how to make a bracelet or a sword. And I think about the show we did on graphene. Yeah. And the amazing things that graphene can do. Oh man, the ties in with that graphene and black rock. It's really, really interesting. Like that, like the, I saw a guy doing a study on these these things, and he calls them. Um, basically says it has his mind, it has its own mind, and it can find each other and all of these different things. I mean, that stuff. It's really interesting because on Lord of the Rings, they had this. Uh, in the new series that they had, they had this mine that was deep. The dwarves were the miners. The dwarves were the ones who got the metals of the earth out. Um, well, they found this deep, deep cavern that unlocked scary monsters, but it also unlocked this stone that they were looking for that gave these elves 
prolonged life and let them to keep continue to living forever is is crazy, man. Yeah, and at the basis of all alchemy, all the alchemists, they were purported to have the ability to turn lead into gold and the transmutation of metals. And this is fallen angel knowledge. And it, it goes on to talk about uh, the ornaments and the use of antimony and the beautifying of the eyelids and all kinds of costly stones and all coloring tinctures. They taught the art of seduction unto human women. And uh, we, we need say no more about that. And there arose much godlessness, and they committed fornication, and they were led astray and become corrupt in all their ways. Simjaza taught enchantments and root cuttings. And you think about that root cuttings and what we're talking about there. And here again we see the connection from the greatest antiquity. The witches knew how to use the um, uh, peyote, uh, marijuana, all kinds of drugs and potions were used in their enchantments. And this is fallen angel knowledge, how to use things for the corruption of mankind, the pharmacia enhanced uh, witchcraft. And enchantment is one thing to do a spell and enhancing it with pharmacia is another. And that's what we have today, the absolute explosion of pharmacia. This is translated as witchcraft in our scriptures. And there, there couldn't be anything more direct than what we're seeing. And when you have, uh, you know, they're doing everything they can. They're having heroin injection centers, safe injection centers. Uh, they're legalizing marijuana, all that they can. It's just going to be totally legal. And it, a stoned population is a population that can be controlled. If you're stoned or drunk and watch pornography all day and you just uh, play video games, you, you know, you're just a little uh, sheeple that can be controlled. And this is what they want. They really want that. And this is fallen angel knowledge to make these things so accessible and so easy to people. And that's what the Internet has done. You know, there's some good things there, but they have made the grossest of evil just a click away for even the youngest of children. Yeah. Amara, Ar, Armaros, the resolving of enchantments. So they know how to put the spell on. They know how to take the spell off. Jesus talked about Satan casting out Satan. Baraquadial taught astrology. Corcabel, the constellations. Ezequiel, the knowledge of the clouds. Arquiel, the signs of the earth, Samsiel, the signs of the sun, and Sariel, the course of the moon. And as men perished, they cried, and their cry went up to heaven. Mm. Now, in Enoch chapter 65, we have something very, very interesting here. It says, into the days of Noah, and, excuse me, and in those days Noah saw the earth that it had sunk down. Now, I'm not sure what that means. Um, I don't know, but it's interesting. And its destruction was nigh. And this implicates that there was something serious took place in the actual um, body of the earth. And he arose from thence and went to the ends of the earth and cried aloud to his grandfather Enoch. And Noah said three times with an embittered voice, Hear me, hear me, hear me. And I said unto him, Tell me, what is it that is falling out on the earth, that the earth is in such evil plight and shaken, lest perchance I shall perish with it? And thereupon there was a great commotion on the earth, and a voice was heard from heaven, and I fell to my face. And from just reading this, it seems like there was some kind of an earth upheaval going on, whether earthquakes or uh, serious changes, like Jesus said, would be uh, signs in the sun and the powers of the heaven being shaken. The flavor of this and the feeling is that there was something going on in the earth, that there was something serious that was letting all people know that something big was very close at hand. Now, 
in Enoch chapter 65, verse 5 and 6, And Enoch, my grandfather, came and stood by me and said unto me, Well, why hast thou cried unto me with a bitter, and weep, bitter cry and weeping? And a command has gone forth from the presence of the Lord concerning those who dwell on the earth, that their ruin is accomplished because they have learnt all the secrets of the watchers. Now notice, the ruin of the earth was because mankind had learned fallen angel knowledge. Could it be that the ruin of the earth in our day will be because of the same fallen angel knowledge that is going beyond anything that would be legitimate medicine, uh, going into the actual changing of the human genome, there's so many things that you're all aware of that we could talk about. And I believe that is the case as we speak now, that the same fallen angel knowledge that brought about the ruin at the time of the flood, and it is amazing. And we know that there was at this time cohabitation with fallen angels and human women. But the thing here that is mentioned of the ruin coming is the transmission of this knowledge from fallen angels to humans. Yeah. Yeah, man, it's a, it's interesting. I know I keep pointing back to this this film that I just watched recently with the series on the Lord of the Rings, but there was a point like so the people that lived in this elven land, it was like a land of or, or human. It was a human land, but it was like it looked like Atlantis. Okay, it was like this beautiful area that the elves had helped them uh, establish. Um, the the ruler kept having this dream about water coming and destroying it all. And interesting enough, they find this sword that's like it's a technology, some kind of technology where if blood gets on it, it, it turns into the sword of Sauron. And one of the guys gets it and sticks it into the ground and it brings about what we're, what they're talking about, like almost exactly like what they're talking about here about the ground come becoming low, uh, volcanoes taking place, and then the water starts to like rise because the ground is so low uh, in, in the way it's set. So it's interesting, man. Yeah, it really is. And all of these things, uh, they're not coincidental that everything we see on television, the realm of science fiction, that we've got predictive programming, they're drawing upon these old stories, and they're certainly uh, coming forth again. Now, can you go back to that last verse, John? Oh, I think there's something in this that. last verse we need to look at here. I think Oh, there we go. All right. All right. Now, let's look at verse 6 here in Enoch 65. And a command has gone forth from the presence of the Lord concerning those who dwell on the earth that their ruin is accomplished because they have learnt all the secrets of the angels and the violence of the Satans. Now, this is a word we're going to be looking at. And notice it doesn't say Satan. It says Satans and all their powers, speaking in the plural, multiple Satans, the most secret ones. Now, have you heard about the Satans? And most people have not. If you do not listen to uh, FOJC or Now You See TV, you've not heard about the Satans because they're the most secret ones. Very few people, I don't know of anybody, outside of Now You See TV and FOJC that have talked about the Satans. And it's right here. And in the book of Enoch, which claims in the very first verse that it is a book that is given for revelation to God's people uh, in the end time tribulation. Now, this could be important. Now, excuse oh, me, John. Sorry, let's sorry go back. I keep going. Oh. Yeah, uh, but I want to read the rest of this. And it says, we have learnt all the secrets of the angels and the violence of the Satans and all their powers, the most secret ones, and all the power of those who practice sorcery and the power of witchcraft and the power of those who make molten images for the whole earth. Now, here we see the Satans tied to witchcraft and sorcery. And I think that a lot of of the intense warfare and struggle we're feeling is coming from very high level energized witchcraft that is coming down from the very top 
And I, I think this is something we're going to have to really step up our game and pray about. Especially the sorceries part of it. And, you know, we on our last Midnight Ride, we discussed a lot about sorceries um, because that was the, the kind of the title of the show about enchantments and sorceries. Yeah. To do it at the level that they're doing, it isn't just, uh, you know, a couple people falling for it. This is the whole entire world. So the level that they're doing it can only be done by somebody that truly um, has learned this secret, uh, secret, secret knowledge. Yeah. And I, I think we're at the time where uh, these things are being released on us early do. Now, in Enoch chapter 40, 40, verse 7, and I heard the fourth voice fending off the Satans and forbidding them to come before the Lord of Spirits to accuse them who dwell on the earth. Now, this is a real clue. It gives us a biblical context by which we can understand these Satans, not Satan, but Satan's plural. And in Revelation 12 and 10, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now, when you would ask the question, has the accuser of the brethren been cast down? And many people will argue that the accuser of the brethren has already been cast down. And, uh, the, but I tell you, each and every one of you that is a born again child of God, when is the last time that Satan accused your conscience and tried to drag your sins out from under the blood to condemn and accuse you. There is not a child of God that does not experience this and does not experience this on a much too frequent basis. And what I say, when the devil reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future because his future is not going to be a very good one. But every child of God knows that Satan is still accusing before the throne of God because we can feel the effects of it. Yep. We can feel the effects of it. Now, in this text in the book of Job, it brings out the scene that will help us to understand what it means in the book of Enoch and in the book of Revelation, Satan as the accuser of the brethren accusing God's people before the throne. And John, if you will, read Job chapter 1, verse 6 through 12. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like him in the earth, and perfect and upright man, and that feareth God, and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Did Job fear God for naught? Has not thou made a hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he has is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Joseph Carl, in his commentary, commented on this passage, some very insightful things. Joseph Carl was a Puritan, and he's so interesting to me because every sermon he preached was on the book of Job. There's a huge set of commentaries here. Every sermon he preached on every verse in the book of Job. It's amazing, and he synchronized all of the Word of God into the book of Job. It's really just unique. This was published in 1666, the year that London burned. And it's just amazing. But this is what Mr. Carl said about this text. How many visible walking Satans are there among us, enemies of all goodness, oppressors of all righteousness, opposers of our peace, opposers of our liberty, opposers of the gospel, opposers of Christ. And we must be very careful. When Jesus forgives our brother and sister, we must forgive them also. And when we keep dragging 
their past sins that they've asked forgiveness for out and accusing them and holding it against them. We have become an accuser of the brethren. We have become a little Satan. And many people are all too willing to do Satan's job for him. You know, I was just thinking about something too, David, on a mass scale of an accuser. Um, part of a, an accuser's job would be to gather intelligence on people and see what they're doing. And think about these social media apps, these large scale social media apps. They're just like the perfect intelligence gathering for an accuser. Who would, who would rather have control over all of those, the, the eyes that are in that, you know, other than the accuser? Oh, my goodness. And, you know, I think of people, bless their heart, they want, it's like their whole life is a reality show. Mm -hmm. They want to put their whole life. You know, well, this person said this to me last night. I feel this way about it. Just nonstop drama. Yeah. My yeah. goodness, I, it is just amazing. But you're so right. And yeah. I tell you, Satan wants to know everything about you. He wants that chip in your car. So yeah. he knows wherever your, where your car is every minute. And he can hit the switch and shut it off if he wants to. He wants to know everything you buy. You see, information is power. And this knowledge, and it's coming through, I believe, what is fallen angel technology. Yeah. Yeah, I'd imagine he wants to chip in your brain, too, so he can really know what's going on. Yeah. Well, you know, Elon can put the the thing in the monkey, and he can play a video game. So, yeah. you know. He just bought Twitter, too, so. Yeah. Did yeah. you see his Halloween costume? No. You're going to have to look at that. Oh, man. He came, he showed up at Heidi Klum, who is the... Um, in the fashion industry and he showed up her party wearing a outfit called the devil's champion it cost seven thousand five hundred dollars the devil's champion but don't worry elon's here to save you he's here to put trump back on twitter and you know save the the conservatives and you know <coughs> as i thought was just today I've thought so much about the scripture we talked about in Second Estrus about the right head eating the left. To, and in Israel, the right wingers with Netanyahu have totally beat the left. The right has head has ate the left in Israel. I think we're going to see the right head eat the left right here in America in this election. And we've seen that also with Elon Musk taking away. And, you know, who knows what he's going to do? I don't know if he's going to, what he's going to do. I don't have as much uh, high hopes on Mr. Musk as a lot of people do. No. But it, are you looking at that now? Yeah, I'm looking and at it. Yeah. And look at Julia Fox dressed like actual, like with horns like the devil. And he's got that, he's got like a Baphomet looking like a goat on his chest there. That's, that's creepy. That is beyond creepy. Yeah. And, um, and you know, these things are designated to send messages. I don't wonder who this is a message to. Yeah. That he's the devil's champion. Yeah. Yeah. I tell you what, it is. Uh, and the, the store he bought that from in New York was called Abracadabra for 7,500. You can go online at that store and look at that same suit that he bought there. Wow. So, yeah, that's what I'd want to pick, the devil's champion suit. Yeah, let's wear that. <laughs> yeah, that's all we need. Oh, my gosh. Now, it's insightful to me. In the Word of God, there is Satan, only one Satan mentioned, but Mr. Carl talks about Satan's plural multiple times. It's amazing. And at this time, the book of Enoch had not been recovered to publish the text and make it available. So he did not have that to look at. But he goes on to say, now is a time that Satans are let loose in the world. The devil now, if ever, works mightily in the hearts and spirits, in the hands and tongues of these children of disobedience. Christ has many challengers. Let them find some champions. Amen. Now it is time to raise your spirits, not only to love the truth, but to maintain the truth, as it is the height of of wickedness not only to do evil but to oppose good for it is the height of holiness not only to do good but to oppose evil mm -hmm. and i find it very profound and you know and i um and i know we understand that we become a little satan the word satan means adversary and satan is our adversary by accusing us before the father and when we accuse others and bring those sins out 
from under the blood, you're little Satan. Yeah. You're little Satan. We need champions, not little Satans, like Amen. Brother Carl said. Um, in Ephesians 1 and 3, now we're going to look at some texts here. And one of the arguments, you know, one of my things I've emphasized for a long time is that, and I, I think it's obvious, Satan now is accusing us at the right hand of, uh, at the throne of God. Now, this is an established fact we see in the book of Job. And some people in Revelation 12 say he's already been cast down. He has not. And we know this because we're still being accused, but we can prove it. And we're going to prove it by a f Greek phrase in the book of Ephesians that's used five times. And we're going to look at this same Greek phrase the way it's used five times in the book of Ephesians. And we're going to see that we are still fighting before the throne of God. Now, the first one is in Ephesians 1 and 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Now, here's the phrase in heavenly places in Christ. In the next text, in Ephesians 1.20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Now, here we're getting more specific, aren't we? That Greek phrase, it's specifically where Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. In the next text, in Ephesians 2 and 5 and 6, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There's our phrase again, in heavenly places. And in the text in Ephesians 2, it's defined again as specifically where Jesus is at, the right hand of the Father. Ephesians 3 and 10, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Now, this is saying that the Israel of God can make some things known under these principalities and powers at the right hand of God. We're talking about spiritual warfare here. And when we put the phrase here, it's defined itself. And by the time we get to Ephesians 6 and 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, and here it is again, in high places this greek phrase defines the location of our battle we battle with these things at the very throne of god just like job when job was accused it was because satan came before the father to get permission to tempt him but now what's changed like ephesians 3 and 10 said we can make known unto these principalities and powers the manifold wisdom of god What's changed is we are now seated in heavenly places and we have a seat at the table. We have a seat at the table. Job cried out, oh, that there was a daysman that could uh, intercede before me. And he did not have Christ at the right hand of the Father. What a great job Job did. He came to total meltdown. <laughs> I mean, he, he just, I mean, he had total meltdown and no wonder but what a man of faith he was. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And sometimes when the darkness is all around us, that's what we have to cry out. Though you slay me, I will trust in you. But there's no way in the world Satan is cast down. We, how, who could sanely deny that that battle in the heavenly places is not raging? And this very plain truth hides from the fact from people in the book of Revelation that the accuser of our brethren is going to be cast down. And when he is cast down, it's going to be game on. I mean, Satan, so many people think that they are taking the toughest punch they can from Satan right now. And that is so far from the truth. He is going to be cast down 
end of this earth, and we are going to see the earth cast out the Rephaim, and it's going to be game on. It's going to be game on, and that's why at every opportunity, and you see, could that be important? And this is what we're seeing here in the book of Enoch. We're understanding that this is this event is coming. This event, uh, we, we did a show on Halloween. We called it the Halloween Apocalypse. And I think this is a lot of the predictive programming that there's going to be a time when the walking dead, yeah, I mean, you won't have to watch the TV show. You'll just have to look out in your backyard. Yeah. In Enoch 69 and 4, it lists the Satans. Now, there are, and we've done teachings on this before. Uh, we've got them up on uh, Now You See TV, multiple teachings. John can put the link on them there. But if you haven't been listening to FOJC or Now You See TV, this will be totally new to you. And we're, we're going to show a lot of things here, but we'll just begin by showing you that there are five Satans mentioned in the book of Enoch. And we're going to, well, we'll just begin by showing you the Satans in the book of Enoch, the five of them. The name of the first, Jaquan, that is the one who led astray all the sons of God and brought them down to the earth and led them astray through the daughters of men. Now, the Bible tells us that the angels left their first estate and actually had cohabitation with human women to produce the Nephilim and the Rephaim. Now, many people don't believe that. And, and it's a sad to say that most pastors and most Bible schools will not teach that. They will teach the Sethite theory, and they will say that, well, the sons of God, that they were the sons of Seth. And, yeah, I mean, that's just crazy. You know, you can have uh, mean men marry nice women or nice men marry mean women, and it just don't work out. You know, giants don't come out. I mean, yeah. this is just ridiculous to maintain that this is what's going on. But so many people are fooled into that. Now, in Enoch 69 and 5, and the second was named Asbeel. He imparted to the holy ones of God evil counsel and led them astray so that they defiled their bodies with the daughters of men. Now, what I think is going on here is that this first Satan talked them into it, and this second Satan taught them how to do it. He came up with the way for the fallen angels to actually, and what we're going to see happen, they actually left their body. They left their body and were able to assume a form that, made it compatible for them to have relations with human women. It's interesting, David, too, and this is just a thought, but, you know, it talks about the angels being stars and leaving their first estate. And interesting enough, you always see Satan being, you know, Jesus said, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. Um, this idea that these watchers who were on high watching uh, came down to Mount Hermon. It's interesting because, like, you know, even in the Paramount pictures, I know um, this has been pointed out by many people, but there is a certain amount of stars that come down to this mountain. They make their way down this mountain and they form this arc over the mountain that's said to be Mount Hermon. And there's a specific amount that relates to exactly how many rulers of the Watchers there were that came down to that mountain. It's really interesting. That is absolutely interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Wish I had that to play for you guys, but oh, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, now here in Jude six, and the angels which kept not their first estate, and from reading the book of Enoch, we understand that it was two. And what these satans are, they're seraphim. These satans are seraphim, and we're going to be uh, making that plain and confirming that from the word of God. And we had one Satan, one seraphim. That which are a higher order than angels. We have cherubim, seraphim, and ophanim, and the ophanim is only spoken about directly in the book of Enoch. We can show you the ophanim in Scripture too, but th that's beyond the scope of what we're doing today. But we basically what we have going on here, we have one seraphim talking an end to it, and we have another, another seraphim telling them how to do it. 
Now, we can't know everything about just how they did it, but we can get a pretty good idea. In Jude 6, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. Now, that word habitation, you can look that up, and it's 3613 in the Greek. It's the word octarion. Now, we will let the Bible interpret the Bible. In 2 Corinthians 5 and 2, For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house. That word house in 2 Corinthians 5, 2, this is 36, 13, octarion, the same word that's translated habitation in Jude 6. So this house, which is from heaven, is clearly in this text the glorified body that believers will one day receive. So we can see here what's going on, that these angels were able to leave their body and assume some other form by which they could cohabitate with human women. And this was brought about by this high uh, knowledge, and evidently the angels wouldn't have known how to do it unless they were taught it by the seraphim. Interesting. It is extremely interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And, and you see, in the, in, the, in the Word of God, if all you would ever do is read the Scripture, you'd be fine. But I believe, and I'll just read this, I believe this with all my heart, and I, we, we do not hold the book of Enoch on a par with Scripture, but at the same time, I believe God is using this book in the last days to show us things that are very important. And in Enoch chapter 1, verse 1, the words of the blessing of Enoch, wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous who will be living in the day of tribulation when all the wicked and the godless are to be removed. And I think there's some very important things here that we need to pay attention to. And in Second Peter chapter four, chapter two, four and five, for if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And Scripture speaks plainly of these angels that sinned in the time right before Noah, resulting in the flood. And the, the sin of cohabitating with human women, it was actually a secondary result behind this we have this fallen angel knowledge and maybe we should call it seraphim knowledge because the knowledge you see if it wasn't for the knowledge of how to leave their body to cohabitate with human women the angels couldn't do it and the seraphim imparted the knowledge to them and then the fallen angels imparted the knowledge to mankind, and we see the effect this fallen angel knowledge has had looking into things that the Father meant to remain secret. He, he created men, male and female. He did not, <laughs> it's obviously not his will of all of these uh, transgender things we're seeing. I mean, this is just doesn't even need saying. Now, in Enoch 69, verse 6 and 7, and the third, and this is the third Satan named Gadriel, he it is who showed the children of men all the blows of death. And he led astray Eve and showed the weapons of death to the sons of men, the shield and the coat of mail and the sword for battle, and the weapons of death to the children of men. And from his hand they have proceeded against those who dwell on the earth from that day and forevermore. Now, the people that do take the time to look at the book of Enoch, they almost always get this wrong, and they says, well, Gadriel is Satan, and they make Gadriel another name for Satan, which it obviously isn't, because we're, we've got Satan's plural. Satan's the big guy. And we're going to show you there's another Satan in Scripture to go with the five in the book of Enoch to make seven. 
and seven is a huge number. And every everything that's done in the kingdom of Satan is a direct imitation of the kingdom of God. We have the angels of the seven churches. We have the, the seven angels that blow the seven trumpets. The, the angelic hierarchy of the kingdom of God is comes down in sevens. And we can also see fours and threes. It's a very arranged, structured kingdom. And Jesus said Satan has a kingdom also. He has, Satan is a very intelligent entity. He's a fallen seraphim. And there are other entities that work with him to destroy mankind. And they're so effective, it's mind-blowing. And it says here, uh, the third was Gadriel who led astray Eve. Now, this is something I want to share with you from the book of Adam and Eve. And the book of Adam and Eve is one that we must take with a big grain of salt. And all of the Adam and Eve literature, some of them are just crazy time Gnostic. Now, this book is not crazy time Gnostic, but yet it does not rise to a high level of credibility. But at the same time, there are traditions here there's a, I read on a, one of our DLCs just last night talking about uh, the scriptures and the non-canonical references to Adam and Eve establishing a place of worship right at the Garden of Eden where they were cast out. Now, that's a real fascinating subject. Yeah. And here's another ancient tradition. Now, just, just ask yourself this. Have you just messed up one time? Mm -hmm. I mean, did you just mess up one time and that was it? Well, Eve started this thing. She was the mother of all living, and she didn't just mess up one time. She messed up multiple times. And this gad reel led Eve astray after that initial fall. And there's this tradition that comes to us from the book of Adam and Eve. And it says, in 18 days passed, then Satan was wroth and transformed himself into the brightness of angels and went away to the river tigress to eve and found her weeping and the devil himself pretended to grieve with her and he yeah the devil cares for you and he began to weep and said to her come out of the river and lament no more cease now from sorrow and moans why art thou anxious and thy husband adam the lord hath heard your groanings and eve was repenting and, you know, you know, Lord's heard your groanings and accepted your penance. And all we angels have been entreated on your behalf and made supplication to the Lord. And note here that Satan very easily deceived Eve in thinking he was an angel of God. Now, that couldn't help happen to any of us, could it? Yeah. You know? I mean, here you go. And it, he goes on to say, uh, the Lord God hath heard your groanings and has accepted your penance, and all we angels have entreated on your behalf and made supplication to the Lord. And he has sent me to bring you out of the water and give you the nourishment which you had in paradise and for which you are crying. And it goes on to talk about Satan <laughs> and Eve walking away together there. So, you know, Eve was deceived more than just that first time. And this was what Gad Real did. He led Eve into uh, problems after that first time. Now, in Enoch chapter 69 and 8, and the fourth was named Panume, he taught the children of men the bitter and the sweet, and he taught them all the secrets of their wisdom. And there is an entire genre of wisdom that is totally satanic, from Sophia of the Gnostics to Barbello of the Gnostics, this is all seraphim wisdom, and it's not the wisdom of God. And in Enoch 69, 12, and the fifth was named Kastija. This is he who showed the children of men all the wicked smitings of spirits and demons and the smitings of the embryo in the womb that it may pass and the smitings of the soul, the bites of the serpent and the smitings which befall through the noontide keat, the son of the serpent named Ta bet. Now, isn't it amazing that how to kill the embryo in the womb was taught by fallen angel knowledge? Yeah. Isn't that just amazing? It makes sense. And my goodness. Uh, and you know, just think of it. 
there would ne- I, I, it, it's beyond thought that a woman with her child in her womb would take that child's life without tremendous satanic confusion and instigation. Yeah. And I know that, and you know, there's grace and forgiveness for women that have had abortions because the tremendous pressure that is put on uh, young women from society and from, I mean, it's crazy. There's so many things wrong with our world today and so many of these politicians, all they care about, well, uh, we've got to have the right to take these children's lives. It's unbelievable. It really yeah. is. Yeah. And this too is fallen angel knowledge and it's fallen angel agenda. Now in numbers chapter 21, verse eight and nine, and the Lord said unto Moses, make thee a fiery serpent. Now that word in the Hebrew is seraph. It is seraphim. God said unto Moses, make thee a seraphim and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. Now look what Moses did. And Moses made a serpent of brass. Now that word is not seraphim. It is the word nakash. And basically what's going on here, the Lord says, make seraphim and uh, put it upon a pole of brass. And the Lord and, er, and Moses, instead of making a seraphim, made him a kosh and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any, when he, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, we know in Genesis 3 and 1, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And I think that's because he come up out of the ocean. But that's another story which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now, Satan, the seraphim was in the serpent and Satan entered into the serpent to engineer the fall of mankind. Now, Moses knew something about this. You know, he wrote the book of Genesis, so he was really up on this. And in Genesis 3, 14, and the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. Now, there was a change in the serpent. The serpent was capable of speech. And that kind of stretches us out, but uh, there's a there's a lot of texts in the book of Jubilees about all animals before the fall being able to talk. We'll not go there, but it's fascinating. But the serpent was not a crawly snake instead of, until it was cursed. And when the serpent was cursed, the seraphim that was in that serpent became a nakash, a little crawly snake. So when Moses held up, the nakash on the pole, that was the sign of the seraphim cursed. When the serpent was cursed, it became a nakash. And Moses held up the nakash, the sign of the cursed seraphim. And when the seraphim was cursed, this is our victory. And of course, what they what do they do with it? It says in 2 Kings 18 and 4, he removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made for un, for unto those days, the children of Israel did burn incense unto it. And he called it Nehushtan. So what did they do? They took this symbol and, and of course they worshiped it as their God, the seraphim. And they took it into the groves where they did their idolatrous rites and rituals and they worshiped this, this serpent of brass as their God, because that was their God. They worshiped the serpent. Wow. In Ezekiel 31 and 3, Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with the shadowing shroud and of an high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. Now, here we see another fellow that 
you know, he's hidden in plain sight. This is an invisible scripture, you know, because people don't know, they don't have a context to unpack Ezekiel 31 because of the Ezekiel 31 talks about this guy being a tree and being in the garden of Eden. And he goes through a fall and expulsion, uh, in Ezekiel 31, uh, just like, uh, Satan being judged. So in, in the next verse here, and we'll look at this next, this next slide. Now, what does it mean? It said the Assyrian was a tree in the Garden of Eden. Could it mean something like this? We've talked about predictive prome and all the way back to the Wizard of Oz. We had these talking trees, didn't we? And now in the Lord of the Rings, we have more talking trees. Could it be that there really was talking trees? What did it mean when it said the Assyrian was a tree in the Garden of Eden? Could it be something like this? Yeah, I mean, it seems it seems pretty interesting. And in almost every, there's tree deities like in almost every religion that you look at, you know, including Hinduism, um, Jainism. I mean, all of the Aryan religions, old Aryan religions, there are trees that are considered tree gods, tree deities. Yeah, they all got them. Yep. They all got them. So I'm thinking that it might be just something like this when it said the Assyrian was a tree yep. um, in the Garden of Eden. Absolutely. Now, in the next text, or in the next slide here, Ezekiel 31 and 8, the cedars in the Garden of God could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. So now we've got the Assyrian in the garden of God. Well, they never showed me that in vacation Bible school. We had the flannel graph, and we had the tree and the serpent, and uh, they had an apple there, and Adam and Eve and the animals, but I didn't see this guy. But the Bible says he was there. And in 31, 15, and 16, it says, thus saith the Lord God, in the day when he, still referring to this Assyrian, went down to the grave, I caused a mourning. I caused the deep for him. I, I covered the deep for him and restrained the floods thereof. Now we got a flood going on now. And, uh, and there's just so much here that I can't put in context. The main point here, we want to see that this Assyrian in the Garden of Eden, he was an entity, and we see him being judged and thrown out at the same time Adam and Eve were. And the great watchers were, the great waters were stayed, and I caused Lebanon to mourn for him, and all the trees of the field fainted for him, and I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall. Very reminiscent of his Isaiah fourteen twelve. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, for son of the morning, which didst weaken the nations. I could ask, well, what nations? And we could show you that, but uh, we've done a lot of teaching to unpack this and put it in context on FOJC. We did a series on uh, the pre-Adamite world. I think I called it Genesis Revisited, and I did about 10 lessons to really unpack this. But most people uh, bless their hearts when they read these things because of what they've been taught. They they just have to declare it in visible scripture. We can't believe this because this goes against everything that we've been told. So therefore, we'll just send it to the cornfield. But it's real and it tells us something. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall, speaking of the Assyrian, when I cast him down to hell with them that descend under the pit. Same thing that we see in Isaiah 14 with Lucifer. And we're going to look at Isaiah 14 in a minute. The first part of Isaiah 14 is about Lucifer. The second part is about this guy, the Assyrian. Now, in Isaiah 10, O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger, here again, over and over, thank God for the King James Bible, it correctly translates this. We're not talking about the Assyrians or the country of Assyria. We're talking about the Assyrian. We have an entity here. The rod of mine anger and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. I will send him. We're talking about an entity here. I will send him against a hypocritical nation and against the people of my wrath, and I will give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. 
Howbeit he meaneth not so, neither doth his heart think so, but it is in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. In the heart of this Assyrian is to destroy. He is the destroyer. And I believe he is indeed the same one that is spoken of in the book of Exodus chapter 12 and verse 23. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in under your houses to smite you. And we see that throughout history, this destroyer has been released from the pit to be an instrument of God's judgment. And it clearly sees in uh, Ezekiel 31 that the Assyrian, the destroyer, was put in shoal into the pit. And Revelation 9, 11, it clearly says and tells us, and they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. And in, and I need another scripture, John. Do we have a Bible here? No, just tell me which one you need. Uh, Isaiah 14, and let's see about verse 29, I think. And it talks about the return of the Assyrian. Okay. Uh, See if my pooter's working right. Read Isaiah 14, 29. Okay, it says, Rejoice not thou, whole Palestine, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery and flying serpent. Um, you continue here. That's good. Yeah, okay. Now, if you look at the second part, the second half of Isaiah 14, it's talking about this guy. It's talking about the Assyrian, and it talks about the power of him being broke off the Levant because he was again restrained. But it says, don't rejoice, Palestine, because this guy that's been broken off you, he's coming back, and his fruit will be a fiery flying serpent. Look that up, seraphim, seraphim. This guy is a seraphim. Satan is a seraphim. The Assyrian is a seraphim. We have five seraphim in the book of Enoch. That gives us seven. No surprise there. And this, without the book of Enoch, there's a lot of this we can conclude from Scripture. But the book of Enoch helps us so much to confirm the word of God and to give us a real full picture of what these seraphim do. These are the Satans. They are the highest order of fallen entities, and I call them celestial beings. We have fallen angels, and then we have the, I call the celestial beings, we have the seraphim, the cherubim, and the ophanim, mm -hmm. and we see these spelled out. And you know, the more Jesus said to be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove, you know, literally be wise as a serpent. Well, that serpent uh, he was the vehicle by which the serapin, seraphim entered to engineer the fall of mankind. So it does behoove us. The more we know, the more we are able to pray effectively. And I always relate it to uh, squirrel hunting. You know, you could go out, you could hunt a squirrel, and you could just point your shotgun up in the tree and shoot. You're probably not going to hit a squirrel. You'll probably scare the little fella. But if you can see him and take aim, you're going to get the guy. That's the way prayer is. Targeted prayer brings results. And when we understand uh, when we can be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove, we can pray more effectively at these schemes that Satan is uh, perpetrating upon us because they're, the day we're living in right now, there is, uh, I believe, that we're experiencing a greater height of demonic power than we've ever experienced. I think we're on the very cusp of the release of the restrainer in a major way. And we're going to have to really buckle up and understand that our adversary is an ancient one. He has many other powerful entities working under him. 
and we also want to understand. Yet, John, let's wind it up. Read Colossians 3, verse 14 and 15. And this speaks of the victory that was accomplished at the cross over all these principalities. And oh my, they're, they can be overwhelming, I guarantee you. But we have to remember in the cross, he just didn't defeat them, but he humiliated them. Colossians 3, what, dude? 14 and 15. It says, And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which ye also are called one body, and be thankful. Is now that, that's real good, but let's do chapter 2, 14 and 15. Okay, all right. I was Little wondering what that had to do. I, I was like, I like it. right. a good ending. But that's yeah. a good one, but yeah. Leo, let's try chapter 2. I might, if I have to do this over 10 times, we'll just give up. I think, I, this is this. I think this might be all it. Right. All right, it says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. Praise God. He, he, he didn't just defeat them. He turned it into a clown show. He humiliated. He spoiled them. He humiliated them. And we have to understand that in the crosses or victory, boy, I guarantee it ain't in your power. Uh, the minute we think it's in our power, we're going to get a big whooping. But if we keep our faith in the cross where these entities were spoiled and defeated, we will do well. And we will be able to withstand in these last days when we are having an absolute release of this fallen angel knowledge, bringing our world to destruction just like it did the world before the flood. Amen, David. Thank you for leading us through that part of the book of Enoch. That was awesome. Uh, something you just said it there at the end about being wise as a servant, blameless as a dove. It just, uh, you know, a lot of Christians walk around and they do the opposite. Um, they are wise as a dove, which doves aren't very wise. And they are harmful, harmful as a serpent, you know, with, a, with their lack of wisdom, being able yeah. to perceive things correctly. They do the opposite of that. And man, you know, what a, if we could really just take hold of what that means to be wise as a serpent, I think it would really help a lot of people, you know, oh, a big yeah. time, yeah, massive, if nothing else. But thank you, David. Um, if you if you guys are like what you heard here, uh, make sure you check out the rest of them. We have a whole list all the way up to this chapter. We're going to continue through this, and uh, we hope that you guys enjoy it. We really, really do, because I know we enjoy it a ton. And it's really been a big blessing in both of our lives. And thanks once again, David, for doing this. Thank you, John. My great honor and pleasure. All right, guys. We'll see you guys next time.